So today I want to deal with the last part of the message on seeding time. And that is that time has everything to do with the people that you associate with. This is a message that is not always well accepted in the body of Christ. In fact, the truth is, is that many of you reject this message. You just feel that, you know what, I, I'm exempt from this principle. I want you to realize there is no exemption with the principle of seed time and harvest. You can think you're, you're exempt. You can try to convince yourself that you're exempt. You can try to believe that you're exempt. You can try to talk God into your exemption card. But the truth is, is that there is not one person in this room that is exempt from how we spend our time and who we spend our time with. Amen. I said amen. I said amen. You see, every one of us spend time. Now, I want to bring you back to the example real quickly about how we have 24 hours, just like we have $24, each dollar representing an hour of your, your life. This is your life. This is 24 hours you'll never get back. You can never, ever, ever get the opportunity to replant, to respend this $24. Once it is spent, it is gone. And every one of us have opportunity in relationships. We can either spend our time in godly investments or toxic investments. I have a lot of people tell me, Pastor, I just want to be happy. And they're liars. Because don't tell me you want to be happy if you're not willing to change where you're planting your seed. See, where you plant your seed truly is what you desire. Well, I, it's not true, Pastor. Yes, it is. Because where you plant, you know you're going to reap. Don't believe the lie in your own head that you're exempted from the seed that you're planting. Every one of us will reap what we sow. Every one of us will reap what we sow. I said, every one of us will reap where we sow. I said, every one of us will reap where we sow. Listen, I'm stubborn. I said, every one of us will reap where we sow. So let's talk about this. We sow our time. Now, let's just say that you are a conservative sleeper. I, I personally, like, normally sleep between five and six hours. That's my normal sleep time. But they say that most people sleep right around seven to eight. So let's take our seven to eight hours. One, two, three, four, five, six. You want to do eight or seven? Seven. You can't do seven and a half. We got seven hours of sleep. Now, whether you recognize it or not, those are hours you cannot get back. That's why the Bible rebukes those who sleep too much. He calls you, oh, lazy sluggard, is what he calls you. Well, why is that? He said, be like the ant who's wise enough to store up. Come on now. So here we are, and you're saying, well, how does sleep either be godly or toxic? It's easy. Who are you sleeping with? Now listen, if you're sleeping with your wife, but if you're not sleeping with the one that you are married to, boy, it gets awful quiet in the room, doesn't it? Now you see, this is, what, this is the great thing that we do in our lives. We deceive ourselves. We convince ourselves. This is my job as your loving pastor, is to help you realize truth. For the truth shall make you free, not your own mentality. It's the truth that brings the reality of what you're going to receive. So if you are sleeping with an individual that is not your spouse, 
then you are saying to yourself, I desire, come on now, I desire to sow seven hours of my life in a toxic relationship. Well, how is that toxic, Pastor? We love each other. Because how you sow in your relationship will bring a reaping in your relationship. If you sow it in sin, you can't be shocked that when you get married, you're going to also live that way. Am I preaching all right now? You can say amen or oh my, it's all right. Glory, that's a change. So you see, I'm going to leave these, these seven hours up to you. Some of you are saying, well, you know, I'm so invested in my relationship. Well, listen, ladies, if you're good enough to bed, you should be good enough to wed. Shut the boy off. You'll see how much he really loves you. Come on, baby, I just love you. I love you, baby. You know, I just want to show my love to you. I just want to share myself with you. I just want to lay with you, baby. I just want to be with you. Baby, if you're good enough to bed, you're good enough to wed. Shut the shop down and see how quickly the boy moves to saying, I would rather have a godly relationship. What's amazing is that there are many ladies who have so low self-esteem that they actually believe that their worth is what they have between their legs. You're a daughter of the living God. You're God's baby. Don't sell yourself cheap. Make sure you get a godly man, not an ungodly man. Can I hear an amen or oh my? Now listen, I understand that. Some of you are living together in the house, and I'm not targeting you personally, but I'm trying to help you be successful. I'm trying to help you be successful. So, <laughs> now if you sleep with your wife four hours and you sleep with your girlfriend three hours, that's still bad. Everybody with me now? <laughs> yeah, you got me now. Come on. <laughs> so we're going to leave those hours up to you. Mm. So we have hours. How many of you, let's just not raise our hand for that. How many of you know you are going to work? <laughs> I was going to say how many of you work, but I don't want to know. So the Bible says if you don't work, you don't eat. Can I hear an amen? I believe in our welfare system for its purposes. There is a purpose for the welfare system. But what many people do is make it their lifestyle. God wants you more prosperous than welfare. God wants you to rely upon him more than the government. Now, some of you I know are ill and have disabilities. Well, then that's simple. You just keep praying for God to deliver you from your sickness. Can I hear an amen? And God will bless you in your process. I'm not here to condemn or make anybody feel they're badly by accepting social services. There, there are times for that. My pastor, my pastor, before she went on to be with Jesus, when she was in the 1960s, her husband left her, and they were pastors. And the only thing that she did, she had never worked a day in her life. She had raised the children. And she actually went on welfare for about two years before she was able to get herself established. There is a purpose for that. I'm not condemning that, not condemning you. But I want you to know you need to work. Can I hear an amen or oh my? Praise the Lord. So now I want to talk to you real quickly. I'm going to teach more than I'm going to preach about people that are in your life. You see, many of us spend our time with ungodly people. Now, if you work, let's just talk about working. Most people work about eight hours a day. Some of you work far more than that. But eight hours a day, you're spending time with people that you don't have the ability to say whether or not who they are. But if you're a boss, you do. But if you're not, then you might not have the opportunity to say, I want all believers in my office. So that means you're around people and you're listening to people. You're, you're, you're talking with people that are ungodly. Now I want to explain something to you very serious. And that is that if God has placed you and where you are is not an accident. 
In fact, the Bible says the steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord, which means this. No matter what ungodly environment that you're in at your workplace, God has given you the authority and the power and the call to overcome being sucked into the world and uh, that you will be a witness, not just one who slides into their lifestyle. So you've got those eight hours. So now we're looking at 10 more hours, I believe, 10 more hours that you and I have that we spend willingly or we are focused on spending. Now, listen, many believers, they have come from the world. How many of you, how many of you were real hellions before you got saved? Mr. Redner, I'm waiting for your hand to go up. Whew. He's got a testimony. How many of you, man, when you served the devil, you served him well? Listen, I've always said this. If you're going to hell, go well. Don't go halfway. If you're going to serve the devil, my goodness, you're going to go to the same hell. It don't matter whether you're a nice sinner or not. It doesn't matter. Who you are serving determines your destination. Wow, you're awful quiet this morning. I want to talk to you about some of the people that you hang around. You see, whether you realize it or not, you're seeding your time. It is not just that you are sitting and hanging out with your old friends. Every single person in this room, these 24 hours, these 10 that we have left, we have the right to determine where and how we plant. This is our determination. Cody just sent me something the other day about successful people. Successful people actually plan their day in 15-minute segments. Most of us plan ours in a year in advance and hope it all kind of shakes loose. But God wants to bring you to a place that your success is not accidental. And that means that you are determining that who you are around is going to build your life. This is the challenge of our, of our believers. When we come out of sin and into Christ, we have come out of a group of friends that we used to hang out with, we used to party with, we used to cuss and swear with, we would do all the wild stuff with, and now we're born again, washed by the blood of Jesus, and we don't want to just ditch our friends. Can I hear an amen? We like our friends. Maybe they grew up with you. Maybe they went through hard times with you. Maybe they were a strength in a, in a difficult moment for you. They're true friends, but yet now you're born again. I want to explain something to you that's very important. How you spend your time with them will determine not only your destiny, but theirs. Not only your destiny, but theirs. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, Come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. The New Living Translation says it this way. Now come out from among unbelievers. Separate yourselves from them, says the Lord. Don't, be, don't touch their filthy things, and I will welcome you. Psalms 1-1 is very powerful because it goes along with Psalms 1-3. If you want to be that tree planted by the water where your fruit always comes in its season and your leaves never wilt and you prosper, it says this. Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked nor stand around with sinners or join in their mockers. But Jesus hung around with sinners. In fact, they said he was the friend of sinners. So, Lord, I don't understand. Let me explain it to you. When your friends have more influence over you than you do over them, it is time to extinguish the relationship with those friends. Well, you know, I'm just, I don't know if I can. Do you know what they, do you know what they teach in drug and alcohol addictive classes? That once you go through those classes, you can't go back to your same friends. Yet in the church, we hang around, we buddy up to the 
to the bar with them. We sit down, we cuss and swear and smoke with them. Maybe some weed and maybe some stogies and maybe some cigarettes. Maybe we sit back and we just talk about all the old times and all the girls we spent time with and all the things that we did. And you sit back and you say, now that was a great time with the guys. You know what happens is this, is that whether you realize it or not, if they're influencing you more than you're influencing them, you're damning them, not helping them. And you've taken, let's just say, two hours of your, let's just say three hours of your day, and you've deposited that in a toxic relationship. Do you know what the word toxic means? Toxic means poison. Now, my wife has always threatened me. She said, honey, you better be good to me because I cook your food. For years, she said, you know, I know you can't taste arsenic, so you better be really good to me. It was a joke. I think. Jesus. But most of the time, the poison that's in our lives, we don't sit down and eat it willfully, but we take it in small inductions, and it slowly destroys us. You see, this is where the revelation of God comes for how we seed and harvest in our lives. There's another one, and that is called nice people. Many of us seed our time into nice people. I'm not saying they're bad people. I'm not saying they're evil people, but they're people in our lives that do not do anything for us. They do not draw us up. Now listen, I'm not saying do anything for us in the the explanation of you're getting something from them. I'm saying they're not pushing you. They're not encouraging you. In fact, they're keeping you in the same swill that they're living in. So let's just say you sit down and you spend another hour or two with those kind of individuals. You went to rock solid faith. Amen. Then there's another group of people called yourself. How many of you know that many of us are the most toxic individuals that we hang out with? That our minds are twisted and warped and we destroy ourselves and we are our own worst enemies. Can I hear an amen or oh my? The Bible says that Jesus came to heal your soul. That I, I pray that you'll prosper in all things and be in good health, even as your soul prospers, is what the Word of God declares. You see, the Bible declares in the book of Romans, chapter 12, verse 2, it says this. i got to find it. Where are I? There we are. And do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So you see, you spend time with yourself. You've gone to rock solid faith. You've slept with the right person. You're using work not for bad but for good. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might as unto the Lord. You're there as a missionary. But you see, the truth is that most of the time, that's not the way it is. Out of an eight-hour workday, so, you know, you might take one hour to where you're actually investing in the people around you. I just want to be honest, right? We, we, want, we want to be straight up and clear. So we've spent 23 of our hours of seed that we can never go back and respend. Every one of those hours is going to produce a harvest. We cannot fight it. We cannot lie to ourselves. We cannot deceive ourselves. For whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. If a man sows of the flesh, he shall of the flesh reap corruption. But if a man sows of the spirit, he shall of the spirit reap eternal life. We cannot deceive ourselves to believe that we're actually going to get something different than what we plant. And then the reality is that most of us don't surround ourselves with believers. I got a quick example for you. Ready? Let's go. Pastor Dan. Alan has given his heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, every one of us have a past. 
Every one of us have people that we've associated with. Whether they're nice people, whether they're godly people. And, and here's the problem. We've got Pastor Dan and Minister Redner, ministers that work with discipleship, trying to pull Alan forward, trying to pull Alan up, trying to speak into his life and invest the godly things, but yet there are so many people behind him that are pulling the opposite direction. So you've got his old party friends. Brother Bruce. Bruce, I was going to use you as his father. <laughs> so here's Alan striving to go forward. Here's Alan striving to move up. Move up. Pull him up, boys. Here's Alan striving to be more like Christ. He really has a desire to be more like Jesus. He has people that are doing, uh, uh, doing discipleship with him, rock-solid faith. You know, they're speaking into his life, trying to encourage him. They're pulling him up. But Alan has never cut links of toxic seed from the past. And the wild part is we usually have more toxic seed from the past than we'll ever have in the future. So we've got to make a choice. You see, if Alan continues this way, let me tell you what's going to happen to Alan. Alan is not only going to be tired, Alan, after a while, is going to give up. How many people do you know that have started their relationship with G? Alan, get up. Alan, get up. Come on, Alan. Come on, guys, pull him up. Pull him up, Alan. Do you hear me saying, ow, because he's getting rope burned. I have no mercy with this because I want him to feel pain. This example demands pain because this is what we're going through. We hang out with our buds at the bar. We, we, we've gotten saved. We have people trying to pull us up. But we're still not letting go of the past, those toxic relationships. You see, this is, this is Alan's girlfriend. And Alan was sleeping with his girlfriend. Now watch, that's not really his girlfriend. And so what happened was this, is Mackenzie didn't like that Alan got saved. So now she's making her play to make sure she can get Alan back. Am I lying? Until Alan makes a decision, cut her off, Alan. Let go. Out. Until he makes a decision to get rid of his party buddies. Listen now, I know this doesn't make everybody happy, but why lie to yourself? Until he makes a decision that he's not going to party with his two friends. The third one without hair. She's never leaving me. Cut him off, Alan. Yeah, I knew you were fake. I liked you better when you were drunk. How many of you heard that one? You're gone. He cut you off. And then you got his real good friend, man, his best friend, grew up with him. Man, they partied together. They hung out together. Man, they were in first, second, third grade together. And all of a sudden, 
he just keeps saying to Alan, man, you're, you're part of a cult. What's wrong with you, Alan? You're part of a cult. You've changed so much, Alan. I would rather have you hang out with me like we used to hang out. Come on, Alan. Come on, Alan. Until he cuts his friend off. You need to grab that one. Yep. Listen, you're never going to get everybody out of your past. You've got parents, right? But you can govern how you spend your time with your parents. But then many of you still got, let's just say you got saved and you have a, 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 a person that you got born again with who is a, a believer. That's Carla. Some of you got believers in your life you should never have in your life. They're ta- we call them toxic Christians. They're gossiping. They're backbiting. They're not building your faith. They're tearing your faith down. But I love them. We go to church together. I don't want to make them angry. Come to the second service. There comes a place you've got to make decisions for your own life. Cut the Christian loose. Alan, we got a problem. See, you can't always get rid of everybody. You always got to have someone dragging on you. But your goal with them is to drag them to you, not to have them drag you away from what is supposed to be building you. Alan, turn around and get built up. How are you going to spend that? Come on now. In, when, I was, when the Lord gave me this message, I really just want to do that example. But I know I need to add verses. That's why I preach a little bit longer. But here's the bottom line. 24 hours of time. Each hour is seed. It doesn't matter your reasoning or your excuses. Where are you sowing them is going to determine the harvest that you reap. If you're sowing into somebody's life and they're not responding, wave at them. Not be mean to them. It's not that you throw them away, but you stop investing your time in them. I got to say this. I'm not talking about the person you're married to. Just had to say that because I know some folks are going to go, thank God I can divorce them now. It's not what we're talking about. What harvest do you want? God doesn't determine it. You do with your time. Who do you choose to invest your time with? Where are you planting your time? Don't complain to God. Look at your life. You'll find your answer is sitting in your own shoes.